Good evening, friends. So I'll just give a very brief overview on this new sort of a topic which is making waves on diagnostic stewardship uh, as a context setting to the journal that's going to be uh, reviewed on this diagnostic stewardship and its outcomes. So I'll only talk about the whole concept of uh, stewardship. So I'm sure all listeners are uh, hearing about stewardship in antibiotic stewardship, fluid stewardship, antifungal stewardship, sepsis stewardship, so on and so forth. So this is a new kid on the block called diagnostic stewardship. So this could possibly be asked as a question for DNB because it's a new sort of a concept that is emerging. But to be honest, it, it uh, constitutes general ingredients of other stewardship as well. So there's nothing, there's no rocket science in this whole diagnostic stewardship. There's just a uh, sort of an emphasis on trying to calibrate the usage of certain diagnostics. I think that is the gist of this whole thing. So when it comes to definition, in fact, WHO has put a definition to this stewardship, which has different components. Uh, so the definition comes under GLASS, which is Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System. So the whole intent of this uh, diagnostic stewardship is to mitigate the antimicrobial resistance. I think that is conceptually, that is at the helm of the thing as to why we need stewardship. So the definition is coordinated guidance and interventions that one puts in place to improve appropriate usage of diagnostic modality to establish the diagnosis. So the emphasis on is on early establishment of diagnosis by using appropriate tools to guide the treatment properly and to detect the organisms in a timely way and timely reporting and surveillance of the organisms that get identified. So these are the components of this definition. So summarily, you need to put in methods to establish diagnosis very early on to guide the treatment and for surveillance purpose. I think those are the key ingredients of the definition. So, so one needs to have a good microbiological data to ensure safe and effective care of the patient and this can happen with accurate and representative antimicrobial resistance patterns that are documented, collated, and archived so that effective care of the patient in an appropriate way based on microbiological data can happen. So I'm sure uh, every listener would know that every hospital is mandated to have their own antibiogram so that you have some sort of a guidance or a pathway in which the antibiotics are rationalized and one needs to have the resistance patterns that are prevailing in their own System. So this is also part of stewardship, having an antibiogram, having an microbial, antimicrobial data and the resistance patterns to so optimizing the care is all part of the stewardship. Then this will influence the hospital-based treatment guidelines and, and the strategies to curtail and mitigate antimicrobial resistance. So this is the whole pulse of uh, my diagnostic stewardship where the efforts are put in place to have a pattern of the microbiological data, have the microbiology specific treatment guidelines with an intent that you curtail the antimicrobial resistance. So that is the whole philosophy of diagnostic stewardship. So when you look at the diagnostic pathway, typically clinician, when he asks for a, he or she asks for a diagnostic test, there is some sort of a pre-test probability that clinician should have in mind as to why certain test is being asked based on the clinical context and what is the likelihood of that test being positive is something that is dependent on the expertise and the clinical maturity or clinical acumen of the clinician. And then clinician should possibly have a checklist as to what are the type of uh, test that needs to be sent, uh, keeping this pre-test probability. And clinician also should be aware as to what are the types of sample that needs to be sent to uh, establish the diagnosis and 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 uh, and it is also important how these samples are processed and whether it's a sequential processing of the samples or a reflex processing of the samples which will influence the test result and uh, timely sort of a reporting of the laboratory data and conveying it and relaying it to the physician goes a long way so this is the whole cycle or circle of uh, diagnostic pathway in any hospital it would be happening so making this whole sop or this diagnostic pathway seamless also is one of the component of diagnostic stewardship and in the diagnostic stewardship it is important to have a fairly good knowledge about the type of samples that one should keep in mind 
in uh, establishing diagnosis. So you could broadly divide the samples into infective and non-infective. In infective, you would have blood cultures. And of course, you will have serum samples, which obviously look for various viral etiologies like dengue, HVSAG, HIV, so on and so forth, and RT-PCR for any of viral upper respiratory infections. So urine samples are the ones which, are, which also have to be kept in mind. And respiratory, you have sputum, DPT cultures, BAL, and... So in the diagnostic stewardship, the whole emphasis is on molecular diagnostics so that the turnaround time is less and ability to establish diagnosis in a timely way happens much early on. So the whole emphasis is on, there is a renewed sort of an emphasis on molecular diagnostics to get to establish the diagnosis very early. And that is the quintessence of diagnostic stewardship. We are moving from traditional sort of a culture to molecular based diagnostics as an adjunct to uh, establish the diagnosis early on so that usage of antibiotics can be rationalized very early on and mitigation of resistance can happen. And uh, body fluids also is something that one needs to keep in mind when you're talking about diagnostic fevership. And non-infective, you would look at hemogram, biochem, and fat. So this is typically the sort of armamentarium of a blood test that one would send. And it is also important when you're talking about diagnostic stewardship that one is cognizant and aware of the type of tubes and the bottles that are used to send the culture. So some of the tubes that are used are ESR gel separation tube, which is used obviously to take ESR, heparin tubes. So this is important in each unit. What are the type of tubes that are being used and the color codes can vary. So it is important to go back, look at your unit and see what sort of tubes are used for what test. Like in my unit, I don't use heparin tube for coagulation. We use yellow tube. And this is the most commonest tube that is used. No additive tube, which is used for all biochemical tests. Uh, like, uh, like KFT, LFT, so on and so forth. And sodium citrate tube is also again used for, it's like a no additive tube. And gel separation tube is for uh, coagulation. And EDTA tube is what we use for uh, mainly the CBC, complete blood count, peripheral smear, so on and so forth. Uh, so heparin, so for us, in our unit, the blue tube is for coagulation profile we used. And uh, gel separation tube is similar to no additive tube. So in our unit, the yellow, yellow cap one is one we use for biochemical tests. And the EDTA tube we use for uh, CBC, platelets, and hematology, hemogram, peripheral smear, and so on and so forth. So it is important to have a knowledge of this when you're doing diagnostic stewardship because you need to know what is the color coding of the tube and what are these tubes to be used for. And this is important for every nurse that is present to be trained to understand what sort of tubes have to be used for what test. So again, just a reiteration, so light tube is used for coagulation, so yellow or red, which is the no additive is used for biochemistry. Green is used for against chemistry. Pink one is used for hematology, but this one, as I suggest, please refer to your own unit. Like here in our unit, we use yellow for chemistry and we use blue for coagulation and violet for CBC. And lavender or gray is used for glucose or blood alcohol or lactic acid testing. So this is this is something which as an SOP should be in place for diagnostic stewardship. And when we ask for a diagnosis, obviously there is a requisition form. So where all the details of the patient in some format has to be put in place. So obviously you need to, because very likely that some of the samples can get intermixed and a false diagnosis can be highlighted in a patient if there is mixing of samples. So there is an emphasis on uh, appropriating the requisition form to the patient in question. So date is important from, where, from which ward, if it is being sent from ICU, it is important to indicate because these samples should not be mixed with other samples. Then the whole treatment of, of the patient and the diagnosis that is established can be erroneous, which can influence bad outcome. And one should clearly indicate the specimen and one should also indicate the clinical background and the medication patient is on and the test that you are requesting and a contact number to be contacted if there is any report that needs to be reported very early on and a signature. So this is a typical requisition form that needs to be adopted and which also constitutes a part of this old stewardship. And this is an example of how the form looks in with regards to asking diagnosis. And in diagnostic stewardship, there are certain detailing about the way blood is drawn. So in this day and age, most blood is drawn through vacuum trainers or in ICU from the arterial line. And some of the point of care test is done from capillary test and good aseptic precautions need to be taken for any blood collection. So 
And as I already said, the serum samples are typically used for all your biochemistry. So this is the samples which are used for any of these tests. And here, as you see, many of them are of infective nature. Like all serological tests, we use serum samples like dengue, TMB, HIV, and even the biomarkers of sepsis like procalcitonin, CRP, we use serum samples and one needs to be cognizant. And serum samples have to go in no additive tubes and in my unit, it is yellow cap. Or in some units, it may be red cap. And the heparinized tube is used for your coagulation profile and blood gas and so on and so forth. And as I said, the violet tube, which is the EDTA coated tube, is used for your complete blood count, peripheral smear, so on and so forth. So the hemolysis of the sample also can typically uh, give a very erroneous report. And hemolysis of sample can happen when there's contact with water or, in, or if the cold chain is not maintained or when the tubes are rigorously shaken or prolonged storage. And this can give to erroneous results. So basically, whatever I'm narrative is about taking precautions to ensure whatever diagnosis is asked, an optimal result is obtained. And there's no fallacious report that gets reflected due to uh, due to sort of a inappropriate coding of the tubes or in, in or inappropriate handling of the specimen is what the take-home message from all this is. When we talk about infectious samples, sufficient material has to be sent. And if these tests are sent, it needs to be sent before administration of antibiotics. Any infective samples desirably has to be sent before the initiation of antibiotics. And if the samples are contaminated, they need to be discarded and should not be processed. Oral secretion should not be sent for any testing. Catheter tips should not be sent for any testing because these are all not the standard of care that you send these for any of these microbiological tests. And one should take due care in avoiding improper transport and should be promptly sent to the lab without, without sort of a significant time lapse. Very often you would have heard they would call back and say sample is hemolyzed and even the results can get sort of fallacious if a lot of time lag happens between the sample collection and the processing of the sample, either sequential or reflex processing, there should not be significant time lag. So just a brief mention about blood culture, because when you talk about diagnostic stewardship, diagnostic stewardship is confined to all different types of infection. So the, the article that is going to be discussed is diagnostic stewardship, how it influences the respiratory infections. So there are diagnostic stewardship for urinary tract infections, diagnostic stewardship for bloodstream infection. So blood culture, minimum two sets have to be sent. Number, volume, and technique is important. So if uh, CVC is present, one sample should be sent from the central line and one from the peripheral. And peripheral uh, strict uh, aseptic precautions has to be taken. Most importantly, after preparing the part, it has to be dried for one to two minutes and surface of the blood culture bottles have to be cleaned as well before you put the culture into the blood culture bottles. And then we kept it room temperature. And the volume of blood is very important. And it is shown minimum. The amount of blood in the blood culture should be more than 5 ml. And it is shown that every uh, with every uh, ml increase in the blood culture quantity, the yield of blood culture positivity increases by 3%. So minimum is around 10 ml is needed for uh, culture and preferably 20 ml of blood in each blood bottle, blood culture bottle to increase the yield. So with every 1 ml, more than 5 ml, the yield of the culture positivity increases by 3%. And these are the blood culture bottles that one has to be used. So now talking about why this whole thing has emerged is in the light of rapid diagnostics that have come in, which is the reason why diagnostic stewardship has come. So now there's increased emphasis on using multiplex PCR uh, as a means to reduce the time before we get an answer on the type of infection that patient has and usage of other modern technologies like MALDI-TOF, which is matrix-assisted laser desorption time of flight and uh, PNF-FISH, which is the... Uh, uh, so, which is a nucleic acid uh, in situ hybridization, flu uh, nucleic acid fluorescent in situ hybridization. These are some of the newer techniques that are being emphasized to establish the causative organism or causative infection or causative etiology much early on. So, now very quickly looking at the, why diagnostic stewardship, are there any clinical studies to say the diagnostic stewardship improves the outcome? Yes, there are studies. Very quickly, I won't go into the details of the study, just mention 
were all diagnostic fever shift. So this is one study where they have used all pro serum procalcitonin to rationalize antibiotics. There are multiple studies. You know, there are at least uh, at least 10 to 12 good studies where use of serum procalcitonin has shown to reduce the indiscriminate usage of antibiotics and improve the outcome. And this is one of the studies. There are multiple meta-analysis and studies uh, which have come where serum procalcitonin is used as a tool to rationalize antibiotics and curtail the use of indiscriminate antibiotics and even to wean antibiotics. And the rapid diagnosis in skin and soft tissue infections has helped us to recognize TAP infections very early on and shown to improve outcomes. And this is the study which was published in 2020. And even in acute gastroenteritis, rapid diagnostic tools, molecular-based tools, has helped us to recognize viruses like norovirus, enterovirus, or clostridium difficile infections, which has helped us to establish the diagnosis very early on and give a targeted treatment rather than blanket treatment. And in catheter-associated urinary tract infections, there is an emphasis on having regular audits to establish your CORTI rate. Because in our uh, hospital, we regularly do CRBSI rates, we regularly do CAUTI rates, we regularly do VAP rates. And this is important as a part of diagnostic stewardship to benchmark how are our infection control measures, how are our bundle practices that are happening. And this is a quality indicator. So basically, the surveillance tools that we use and maintaining the audit trail of VAP rates, CRBSI rates, CAUTI rates, all this constitutes the whole philosophy of diagnostic stewardship in mitigating the resistant, emerging resistance patterns and put in due measures in sort of bundle format to reduce the risk of uh, infection and optimize our diagnostic tools. So when you look, so this is just the last slide, how when you look at uh, the way the diagnostic stewardship works, so there's a patient who comes, you'll evaluate clinically, then the four components of uh, diagnostic stewardship, like for antibiotic usage, there are four Ds, so right drug, right dose, right duration, and de-escalation. So for diagnostic stewardship, it's the right test and the right patient, right time. So there are four T's which I'll talk. And once the rapid diagnostic test is ordered, so we need to do rapid diagnostic test, and then you adopt the antimicrobial stewardship, and then you establish the diagnosis and initiate the treatment. So the four T's of diagnostic is right test, and the right type of sample, and the right timing of the sample and the right treatment. So these are the four T's. So at the end of it, if you remember the four T's of diagnostic stewardship, that's good enough. So right test, so right type of sample, T is type of sample, right timing of the sample, and initiating right treatment based on this. So in antibiotic stewardship, we talk about four D's, right drug, right dosage, right duration, de-escalation. In fluid stewardship, we talk about four D's. Right drug means right type of fluid, right duration, and right dosing and de-resuscitation. Here it is four T's. So in exam, if they ask if you write these components, I think that would be good enough. So thank you one and all. So I request all of our speakers to, I mean, all our listeners to attend to JIC, which is happening from 17th to 18th October, the signature event of our uh, region here. So I request all of you to participate in this and make it into a huge success. Request all our listeners to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care. So thank you. Thank you, Mandel.